Picture this, you're in some half-baked shopping mall or maybe an out-of-the-way flea market. You come across a vendor selling what appears to be an inexpensive game system. It has an air of familiarity, but it's definitely not legit. And though it's undeniably cheap looking, the quantity of games included makes it hard to outright dismiss it. Today we're looking at one such system. Power Games, on this week's truly inspirational episode of Dance Fever. For all the popularity that Nintendo enjoyed with its Famicom console, or the Nintendo Entertainment System to us Yanks, they also had to spend considerable efforts, time, and money warding off various knockoffs being sold. Informally known as Famiclones, these devices were often designed to be a close approximation of a popular video game console, not necessarily one by Nintendo. They often included simple 8-bit games, very often just a selection of pirated Famicom slash NES games with the copyrights changed or removed. As the technology for replicating the hardware improved, often shrinking down the inner workings of the Famicom onto a single chip, so did the number of Famiclones increase. While a lot of these clone systems were the result of somewhat nefarious intentions and a gross disregard for copyright law, it would be irresponsible of me not to point out that in some cases, these knockoffs were the only option to some, mainly in parts of the world where Nintendo didn't sell official hardware. One notable clone was the Dendi, which was an extremely popular product in Russia from 1992 to 1996. Dendi's manufacturer, Stiepler, did quite well for themselves filling this void. An attempt at legitimizing their product via an agreement from Nintendo to be an exclusive distributor of the Super Nintendo in 1996 proved fatal to their company as licensing costs for the cartridges made selling them unprofitable. The Russian video game market is thriving today, but pirated software is still a huge issue. Meanwhile, back in America, we don't quite have any issues with video game availability. That doesn't stop these clones from popping up in crowding shelves in discount stores hoping to throw off well-meaning gift givers or careless bargain hunters. That's the case with the product we're discussing today, Power Games. If you were to judge a product by its packaging, you'd think that they were selling a box of pure testosterone here. Whomever put this out must have only had time to cut and paste random video game stock images despite having nothing to do with the actual contents. Oh, and I wasn't being lazy when I said whomever put this out. There's literally no information anywhere as to who manufactured this or even what year it came out. And I could look it up on the web, but how could I even verify the information? And really, does it actually even matter? Except it kind of does because I want to find out exactly why they went with a penguin for the console design. My theory is that they had a penguin mold handy and decided to recycle it for this venture, whomever they are. It is kind of cute, until you turn it on, and then it looks possessed and hungry for your soul. The package comes with two controllers and a light gun. The controllers sport six action buttons each, but again, we're playing 8-bit Nintendo games here, which were played on hardware with two action buttons. Did this unknown entity think that there was going to be some use for these other buttons someday? In addition to the gratuitous buttons, the controller is just downright horrible. The D-pad is more accurate than pointing and screaming orders at the TV, but only slightly. And even worse, it's wireless. Not Bluetooth wireless, but RF wireless. Meaning you have to keep the controller pointed at Chili Willy's stomach the whole time while you're playing, lest you lose communications. There's a better looking and feeling controller in the package, and a 9-pin port on the side of the Penguin, so I figured I could just use that. But no, that's only for player 2, and it gets plugged into the main wireless controller, while the port on the side is only for the light gun. Speaking of which, the light gun which was included for the handful of light gun games seems to work, but not in the way I would expect it to. Accuracy seems way off, either scoring hits that shouldn't have counted in Duck Hunt, or the exact opposite in Hogan's Alley or Wild Gunman. I only tested this on a CRT television, the same television which reads the standard NES zapper just fine. By the way, this gun doesn't conform to the toy safety standards we have in the US, and thus does look like a real weapon, so take care on that. The included game is a pirated multi-game cart similar to a standard Famicom cartridge. The label is misleading in a couple of ways. First of all, some of these images are grossly incorrect. Donkey Kong is not the same as Donkey Kong 64, nor is the game Aladdin on the cartridge based on the Disney movie. 
and 111 games while close is still a bit misleading as they counted Duck Hunt and his clay shooting option as two separate games. As an example. The game's position on the wrong side of legit are quite evident the moment you start playing. The menu screen is a bit lacking visually and some liberties were taken with the game titles. Teenage Mutant, what game do you think that is? That's right, TNC Surf Designs. Tecmo Bowl, that's definitely everyone's favorite NES football game, right? Nope, it's a bowling game. You can see file marks in the serial numbers without even having to look closely. The copyright notice alteration in Paperboy is just downright surreal. Sometimes title screens are missing like in Gradius here, or completely altered like in Super Mario Bros., or even renamed something completely ridiculous. Have you ever looked at Dr. Mario and thought they should have named it Space Hospital? Well, someone did. That being said, you'll find some titles on here that are legitimately decent. For example, if you want to play Shigeru Miyamoto's unique Pac-Man clone, Devil World, which was never granted a US release due to Nintendo's strict policy against religious imagery at the time, this cartridge has you covered. Not that I'm giving this a recommendation, this is still a pirated product. And even though you're not helping Nintendo any, you'll still have a less error-prone experience if you hunt and play the original cartridges. Heck, even emulation is a better option. But there are people who do actively hunt down these X and 1 cartridges, warts and all. Understandable, there is a certain fascinating aspect about them in a train wreck sort of way. However, if at all possible, I would recommend against playing on this device. It's not comfortable and very cheaply made. This cartridge will work on an original Famicom. Or, I have a better idea. These days, Famiclones are getting more sophisticated, banishing the cheap knockoffs to the darkest corners of the seediest malls. Multi-game emulation-based consoles like the Retron 5 sport compatibility with NES and Famicom titles, along with other consoles. Thanks to many of Nintendo's original patents having expired by now, these consoles are more legit and thus easier to find. However, these clones, legit or otherwise, are based on replicas of original hardware. This does present inaccuracies and incompatibilities with certain titles. At the end of the day, there's nothing like the real thing. This was a day for TV games. If you enjoy watching me stab penguins in the back with game cartridges, you'll want to like, comment, and or subscribe. And as usual, I will see you next time. What was that you said? You have a song? Oh, I have a Zorzi on the wall on song title. Uh, I'm a box of pure testosterone. I'm a box of pure testosterone. That uh, sounds like the number one hit single of America. <laughs> this is the number one hit single of America. <laughs> I have a box of pure testosterone. <laughs>